second session here, which is getting started with Gibbon. Um, Sandra touched on a few things that you can start playing with as soon as your, your Gibbon installation is up and running. Um, and we'll focus now more on um, some of the sort of nomenclature and data structures in Gibbon that uh, are really helpful to understand and that vary quite a lot from country to country. I think this is probably one of the most common support requests is, oh, what does form group mean? And then we'll explain and the, the, whoever we're helping will say, oh, in my country, we call that a homeroom or a role group or a uh, advisory or a main classroom or whatever it happens to be. Um, so this is a chance to get into some of that. Um, so if you're on our website um, or if you're in Gibbon, you can jump to this um, from the, the system overview page. If you go to support and then documentation, um, you'll find our documentation here targeting different types of users. Oh, sorry, I'm not sharing screen. <laughs> you think after a year of teaching on Zoom, I'd have that one down, but some days it gets the better of me. Right, let me just show that again. Uh, so you're on our website, you can jump to support and uh, head into documentation. And you'll see here the, the four main user types. Uh, to be honest, documentation has never been our strongest suite at Gibbon. Um, we've often been uh, rather busy building the software and the documentation hasn't quite caught up. We're working on that at the moment to try and deepen our documentation, but we have tried to make sure there's at least enough to get people up and running and that the forum then fills some of the gaps. Uh, if you were to click on administrator, um, you'll see a choice for getting started with Gibbon. This assumes you've done the downloading and the installation, which is what we've been discussing. And to, to my mind, this is really the best way to understand Gibbon. Um, there's a video that's now a little bit out of date, uh, but we'll focus on uh, mostly on the school structure here. Um, and Gibbon, I know, can be intimidating when you first start using it because being a flexible system, there, there's a lot of choice. There's a lot of um, school decisions to be made in setting it up. And, and I think that's, it's a strength and weakness of Gibbon um, that's, that's constantly in tension. Um, in the last session, uh, Sandra touched on some of the system settings, which you can get to under admin, system admin, system settings. I'll just recap those very quickly. Um, so that is, so, you used to, when you came to system admin, you used to go directly to system settings. Um, a couple of versions ago, Sandra built this lovely landing page in which you can get access to help more quickly um, and, and you can see more overview information there. So to get to settings now, we can use the sidebar and jump over to system settings. Uh, if you missed the last session, we're, we're previewing the new 2021 theme that, that's being built in version 22. Um, this is available in cutting edge code if you want to try it, but it, it, we're expecting it to ship as the default theme in, uh, in 2022 in June this year. Um, so if it looks a bit different, that's why. Um, it's worth familiarizing yourself with a range of different settings here. There's some things that you, you wouldn't want to touch unless you really knew what you were doing. Up at the top here, if you start changing these, uh, you may find that Gibbon stops working for you. Um, there's uh, a range of useful organizational settings such as the school logo and a, a background image file. You'll see some slight changes if you're used to version 21 that you used to have to upload the file yourself and drop a path. We've now added some file uploaders there. Um, you can set who's who within the system which controls some of the top level notifications um, and, and miscellaneous down here. There's a, a few extra things you can do to, to customize Gibbon for your school. So that's always a good place to start. Beyond that, you're really going to want to start thinking about the structure of your school. Um, and, and here we start getting into real issues of nomenclature and how different schools organize themselves. Uh, fundamentally, Gibbon is based on the concept of a school year or an academic year. That is to say that all of the activity in the school is divided into discrete years those may be calendar years if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, that may be August to June in the Northern Hemisphere, or it may be some other uh, calibration of time that you use. Um, it may be deceptive that it's called a year because you may have three years within a year. 
Um, some installations have one year that lasts forever and they just keep everything in the same academic year. Again, there's flexibility there, but fundamentally, um, at some point, you're going to need to manage your school year. So I'll just show that now. That is in school admin. And it's the default area that you enter, enter manage school years. And what you'll see is that you will have um, a current year, which is flagged in green, one or more upcoming years. And as you move from one year to the next, you'll then have some uh, previous or past years. When you choose to log in to Gibbon, you can actually choose to log into different academic years, different school years. Um, and uh, there's some controls. You can actually prevent certain groups of users from logging into different years. So at certain times of the year at ICHK, we stop students and staff logging into future years because we're drafting the timetable in the future year and we don't want people to see it until a certain date. Um, we then open it for staff to access future years and then later on students. So I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, there is also a year switcher on the side. Uh, this is relatively new. I think it's probably version 19, something like that. You used to have to log in and out to change the year. You can now do that right there. Um, if you are interested in those controls for who can access past and previous years, that's under user admin. Um, and then on the side, it is manage roles. And there's basically a per role control for different years. So here I could say, I don't want students to be able to log into future years, but I do want them to log into past years. Uh, occasionally you might have a group of people that you don't want to log in at all. You just want to represent them in the system, uh, but not have them log in, but that is pretty unusual. All right. Oh, uh, someone, I, I think it was uh, Saqib, when you joined earlier, uh, you asked about accessing the last session. I forgot to answer that in the chat. Um, these sessions are all being recorded and we'll put them onto YouTube in due course. So uh, you'll be able to access that then. So hopefully you'll do some thinking about your school years and for each school year, you'll define the, the start and end date for the school year. It'll have a name and it will have a sequence number that makes sure that the school years always um, show up in the correct order. We can infer that by the, the numbering of the years, but the sequence number lets us be really exact to get always the exact same ordering of the years. A, a good next step then is to look at days of the week, which allows you to turn each calendar day from the week on or off. Um, it doesn't allow you to reorder the days here, but there is a setting to set uh, the, the first day of the week that I'll show you in a moment. But for example, um, for a lot of European-based schools, westernized schools, Saturday and Sunday are off, and so you'll see they're turned off here. You could turn those on, um, enter your operating hours, and then if you wanted to, you could turn other days off. Um, the opening hours are uh, the, the four hours that you set up, sort of when the school gates open, when the school day actually begins, when the school day ends, and then again when the campus closes at the end of the day. Uh, the interface here is, is one of the oldest parts of Gibbon. It's a bit of a relic. It's not the most convenient part to use, but in theory, you're probably only going to use this once uh, and then forget about it. So uh, we might update that in due course. With your days of the week set, which then influences uh, what days appear in a timetable, you can see Saturday and Sunday don't show up. Um, you might also, depending on the region that you live, be interested in setting the first day of the week, which is back in system settings. Uh, first day of the week. The choices currently are Monday, uh, Sunday, and Saturday. No one's ever requested for a Wednesday first day of the week, but we'll see maybe that'll happen sometime down the line. Um, so with, with those basic parameters set, we can now uh, flesh out our school years a little bit further by adding terms. Um, so most schools run with terms or semesters. Again, if you don't, you can have one jumbo term that spans the whole year and then essentially forget about terms. Um, but what you'll see here is that that Gibbon by default comes with the, the two school years that we saw uh, earlier, each have three terms. So you've got term one, term two, and term three in each of 2020, 21, and then 21, 22. 
with each of these, they'll have a start date and an end date and a sequence, and you can edit those dates. Anything that falls outside of term time is assumed to be a holiday. So those spaces between terms are your term breaks, your, your holidays. And so hopefully you're starting to see that we're able to start building up in Gibbon a representation of your school. And that's ultimately the aim is to store in data uh, a version of your school that's accurate enough that lets people use that to, to, to stand in for the, the physical school. In addition to then setting your terms, you can jump into manage special days. This lets you set school closures, uh, public holidays, uh, teacher training days, anywhere where you want the, the school to appear as being closed to those people who come to the school. That means that, that attendance isn't taken, lesson plans aren't given, uh, there's no timetable. So if we wanted to add a special day for uh, today, let's say, let's just find that. So here is today. Let's say we decided to close school today because it's Gibbon training. Um, I can say school closure, it's called Gibbon training day. And that's then going to show up as a red closed day. Students celebrate because they get the day off. Non-Gibbon teachers get the day off and just the nerdy people at school get to come and do Gibbon training. Sounds ideal to me. Um, you can see up here that um, because we use the demo data, we got Chinese New Year and some other Hong Kong holidays and Cass Week and things built in. Uh, that's not there by default. That does come along with the demo data. All right. Once we, we've completed this part of the setup, we've got the basic sort of years, days, and times structure of the school, and we're ready to move on to how we group people and things within the school. Uh, before we move on, does anyone have any questions regarding years, days, and times? Sounds good. Feel free, if you want to ask questions along the way, you can drop them in the chat. Sandra's monitoring that, she can answer. Um, but feel free at any time just to unmute yourself and, and jump in and ask questions. Um, I'll probably say that 20 or 30 times today because I love questions so much. Um, in terms of grouping, Gibbon arranges students into year groups. Every student must be in a year group and that represents the standard school progression from year one to two to three. Um, there's scope to have students skip year groups or uh, repeat year groups. And if your school doesn't actually use year groups for some reason, again, you can set one massive year group to contain everyone. Uh, the same with, with terms. But you're going to want at least one year group, otherwise you can't enroll students. Within those year groups then, which are your batches of students, your cohorts who move through the school, most schools then set uh, split those um, year groups into role groups which tends to be the more US name or form groups which tends to be the more UK name so I said this is sometimes known as something else like a homeroom or an advisory or a tutor group um, but the basic concept is a you have a single teacher who's primarily responsible for the care and well-being of that student so sometimes we call them pastoral groups as well um, role groups actually aren't attached to year groups. And so you can, um, you know, name your form groups so that they sound like they're part of a year group. So if I show you in school admin under groupings, um, you can call, so our year groups here are seven, eight, nine. You can call your role groups 7.1, 7.2, 7.3, 8.1, and so on. But actually, you can mix students from different year groups into a single role group. So if you want to do what's called vertical role groups, that's very easy to do in Gibbon as you enroll students. We've tried to make these data structures as flexible as possible so they work uh, in as many different uh, contexts as possible. Once you have your year groups and your role groups, you can actually jump into people, students, and student enrollment, and you can start enrolling your students into years and role groups. Um, 
if they're already enrolled, like you've got the demo data and the students already enrolled, you can't re-enroll them within a single year. Notice these enrollments are specific to a school year. Um, you'll get an error, but if someone is already enrolled, then you can edit them here. Um, Sandra's going to talk later on about imports, and this is a, a, a great part of the system to, to be importing data. Okay, that, those are the two main groupings initially for students. Um, in terms of staff, a, a good top level grouping to use is departments. These are your main learning areas or functional areas within a school. And this allows you to control access for things like the planner, uh, library, and, and other related modules. Um, so to show you that briefly, under school admin, I would go to manage departments. And you can see here a range of, of departments that again came with the demo data. And you can see different people in the departments. If we were to edit that English department, you would see that different people have different roles. So there's a coordinator who has top level access, and then there's some teachers with curriculum access, and then you might also have uh, teachers or, or people with other roles. So that gives you some sort of fine grained control over who can do what within your, uh, your different departments or teams. In addition, uh, although this actually uses the old name managed spaces, this has been up dated uh, some time ago to manage facilities. Um, so we'll update the documentation. Facilities are, are the physical locations in your school that you might want to assign to different people or to timetable for different areas. As it notes here, there's, there's many other settings in school admin. Um, you can see all the different areas down here. They're not fundamental to the running of the school in terms of the, the overall shape of the school in terms of setting up. Um, so whilst you might want to do an exhaustive look through of all of these, uh, you might also find, well, I'll focus on the main ones and, and come back to, to some others later on. So that's a, a quick overview of school admin, which is one of the first things you'll do in setting up Gibbon before you move on to users. It's hard to manage your users if your school's not uh, set up to a certain level. I'm going to move on to users in just a moment. I'm going to have a quick drink of water and then we'll, we'll keep going. I apologize if there's more listening involved in this than you expected. It will be a long day of listening to me speak initially and then Sandra speak some more later. Uh, if you've had enough, feel free to leave at any time or uh, grab the mic and, and start speaking. Um, so obviously within schools, users are, are, are an important issue. We, we don't have a school without students, staff and parents, and we need to represent those within our system. Before we get around to representing individual users, we really want to start thinking about uh, roles within the system, so groups of users because Gibbon makes uh, access to functionality available to roles via permissions. So you don't say what an individual user can and can't do in Gibbon. You say what a, a, a group of users or a user role can do. Uh, the model here uh, was uh, based heavily on Drupal, which is a content management system um, in which basically any functionality can be given to any other, uh, to any, any role within the system. So let's jump into user admin on screen here and let's head to manage roles. By default, Gibbon comes with uh, five main roles that are, are common to almost all schools in my experience. And these roles cannot be deleted. They can be uh, edited. You can, you can change certain parameters, but you'll see you can't change the names of them. Um, you're, you're basically stuck with those as the fundamental five. What that lets us do by keeping those fixed within the system, it lets us give out certain default permissions when we install modules, and it, it gives us a sort of known quantity to work with in the system. However, you can extend that by adding new roles. Um, and a great way to add new roles is actually to duplicate an existing role. If you just add a role, you'll find you spend a lot of time giving it permissions. If you duplicate an existing role, you can then just tailor the permissions. Um, so by default, administrators have access to everything. 
parents can access things about only their own child or children. Students study in a school and have access to some of their own data. Um, support staff generally don't teach, but they support the, the teaching and learning and administration of the school. They have access to uh, maybe some more back-end functionality, but less on the teaching side. And then teachers have a, a focus on classroom teaching. Um, sometimes this is a bit of an artificial divide. You get plenty of people who span both of these worlds um, but this seems to be a, a sort of common starting point in most schools. Once you've got your roles set up, you can jump into permissions. And this is where you get the real fine grained control of what you can and can't do in Gibbon. So this is arranged by modules. You'll see activities followed by attendance, followed by behavior. Um, and you can narrow down to a particular module if you want, because this table is rather long. Uh, when we first started building Gibbon, having all of this in a single table made sense because there weren't so many roles and there weren't so many modules and, and actions, but it's, it's grown over time. Um, along the top here, you'll see the different roles in abbreviated form. You can hover over to see the full name. And down the side, you'll see a list of actions that are made available within this module. There's one sort of slightly higher level control than this, which is that you can turn modules off altogether. So if I was to go to system admin and look at manage modules and edit the activities module and turn it off, when I return here uh, to user admin, this whole section will have disappeared. What that means is at the very top level, especially for schools that are starting to roll Gibbon out, um, you can avoid overwhelming staff and parents and students by turning uh, a chunk of the functionality off and then slowly rolling out functionality as you need it. Um, within each module, within each action, you can disable the actions for different roles. You'll see that there are, are some boxes that are grayed out because we made a decision in designing Gibbon that probably you never want a parent to be able to action to, act, to access this function. Um, it would just give them access to more information than that you'd ever want a single parent to have. So that is grayed out. It's not available to parents, but I could enable it to support staff. If someone has no permissions within a module, so if I turn everything off for parent and save it, it will stop appearing in the top menu for them. Um, and, and in this way, Gibbon is, is highly uh, flexible and customizable. You simply turn things on or off and they appear or disappear from the system for your, your relevant roles. If we'd added more roles, they would appear here in this top selection. Um, and as you'll see, if I scroll down, there's plenty to learn in Gibbon about what all of these things do and how they work, which is one of the reasons why the forums tend to, to keep us busy. Uh, lots of questions about how different things work. Um, one thing you will notice at the bottom is at the moment, I can't submit this form because of a PHP setting. And there's some advice here about how you can get around that. If you're seeing that and you want an immediate solution, just select one of the modules that you want to work at, work on that one module at a time, and you'll see the submit box appears there. All right, uh, I'm just gonna check the schedule quickly uh, in terms of time. I'm going to pass over to Sandra to talk about importing at some point, but I think we'll push on a little bit more on this side first. Um, again, keep those questions coming. Once you've got roles and permissions sorted, you can then start looking at individual users. If you add a user under manage users, they, they become a person within the system. They're not necessarily yet able to operate as a student or a staff member. At this level, you're basically saying that, let me jump into there, manage users. You are setting the basic parameters of who this person is, giving them a role within the system, a username, a password, um, contact information, background information, and you're saying that, yes, this person exists within the system. They'll then appear in your managed users list. They can sign in. They can access those roles. 
but there's some extra steps in order to um, make them a student, to put them within a family as a parent so they can see children or to add them as a staff member. Uh, we made the decision very early on in Gibbon to store all users in a single table where a lot of other systems tend to have a student's table and a staff table and a parent's table. And our, our decision there was based on the fact that there are significant people within schools that have overlaps. You get uh, parents who are also teachers or you get students who later on become staff members. And so rather than giving everyone separate accounts and storing their information over and over in different tables, we centralize that down to users and then added the additional functionality into these areas. Um, I'm not going to go through these sections in detail, but it is important to know that students won't appear under people, students, and staff won't appear here, and parents won't appear uh, in families until these steps are undertaken. One of the really important things under student enrollment here is the rollover. The rollover is that functionality. Oh, yes, Brian, do you want to go ahead with your question? Well, I'm not sure if it's an exact uh, appropriate time, but yeah. uh, one of the features I, I missed from a previous um, uh, system is as an admin, I would really like to be able to, to uh, see what the user sees uh, as an act in their role uh, when they have a query about things because um, normally I'm not associated with their classes or their uh, things which the so I as an admin I can never see what they see to understand their question and I know I can go in there and change their password but that uh, in the system where they are not logging in with Google that means that I have a change their password and uh, I would have to get them to reset their password next time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, Gibbon offers some ways around that, which I'll show you now. Um, it doesn't let you fully simulate someone else's login, which I know some systems do. Um, th the main approach to take here is to find yourself under user admin. So uh, I'm just going to find myself here and to assign yourself uh, as well as your primary role is to give yourself additional roles. So I'm gonna say here, I'm a parent and a student and a teacher. Um, there's more to this. So if you've done this before and it hasn't helped, just hold on, I'll add a little bit more. I'm gonna submit that. And if I uh, log out of the system, so let me just move this stuff around. If I log out of the system here and log back in, I will see the role switcher down the side here. So I could now switch to teacher view and you'll see my top menu changes. But what you will find if you switch to parent is you don't have any children within the school. What I tend to do there is I tend to temporarily associate myself with the family that is asking the question. So I'll manage that family. I'll add myself as a third parent and I'll be able to see what that parent sees there. Um, likewise, with student, you could place yourself temporarily in a, in a class and see what the student sees there. That's a little bit trickier because you might start sort of appearing in attendance lists and things like that. Um, and that's where actually having a, 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 a Gibbon sandbox or a testing installation running in parallel then lets you really start logging in as other people without messing with their accounts. So I'd have to keep that sandbox, sandbox uh, data uh, basically in sync, wouldn't I? Yes. And so you could have like a nightly operation that takes the backup from your production system and synchronizes it over to the new system. Um, there's definitely some things we could do better there longer term in letting you simulate other people's views. But of course, that raises security problems as well, because if you can pretend to be someone else, you can then do things as someone else and that shows up. Uh, logged to them rather than to you. So we just need to be careful in, in that space. Uh, hi, Ross, Brian. Hi, me? Ray. How are you? Good, thanks. Nice to see you here. You too. Brian, I'll tell you what we do, right? 
normally we create demo accounts, demo classes, just to ensure that we can always have something that nobody else can see. And that really works out a lot for us. So we will create demo accounts and assign ourselves to demo classes and everything. That way we can simulate everything that's happening to the real class environment. Yep, that's a, that's a nice way to do it as well. Thanks, Ray. Um, all right. Yes, thanks for the question there as well, Brian. That's a, that's a good one. And something we'll keep thinking about if, if there's any ways that we can do that differently. It's, it's an issue we, we do come up against ourselves as well. Um, in terms of student enrollment, I noted earlier that when you enroll a student, let me just switch back to admin here. When you enroll a student under manage enrollment, that is specific to a school year. So I have 391 students enrolled in the current year. If I jump to the next year, I have no students enrolled. Um, there's a process within Gibbon called the rollover that takes you from the current year, updates Gibbon into the next year, and allows you to say which role groups people move from as they transition from this year to next year. Um, it also deals with leaving students and leaving staff and things like that. Um, the rollover screen itself, so under manage users, the rollover screen gives you a nice hefty warning about really, really strongly being advised to back up your data before you proceed. Um, and you'll see that, that there's uh, the ability to define a, a year beyond the next year. And then there's options for um, different cases of students. Because I don't have year groups and role groups set up properly, I'm not seeing all the options here. But uh, for example, for re-enrolling other students, we'd see all of our enrolled students and we'd be able to assign them to uh, next year's role groups and school years. We'll see students who are in their final year of school who are set to left because they've graduated. If you have a student that doesn't graduate and is going to repeat a year, you can keep them in full um, and, and keep them within the system. There's a lot of settings that you can, you can adjust here in the rollover. If you have a really big school, you probably don't want to be coming in on the day of the rollover and manually setting all of your users. Actually, even in a medium or small size school, you don't really want to be doing this. Um, and so there's two ways that you can preset enrollment. Um, one is if you're looking at um, your groupings under school year, if you're managing your role groups, you can say that I want this student in 7.1 in 2020, 21. I want them to move into this next role group. You have to set your role groups up for the next year. But I could then select if I had it set up 8.1 in this list. Um, and I'll probably just, just show you that. So I would, uh, I would jump, uh, actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy all of my role groups from this year into next year. Here we are in 2021, 22, we can see all the role groups. Um, I could edit those if I wanted to adjust teachers in classrooms. But what I can do now in the current year is I can say that any students in uh, 7.1 this year will automatically go into 8.1 next year. That will then preset the rollover so that I don't need to manually do that on the day. So that's how I deal with classes, with, with whole role groups or form groups at a time. Additionally, if I had students who were changing role groups and I wanted to manage that under student enrollment, I could go in and enroll students, so selected students in the following year in advance. I can do that manually here or through an import. And then they're automatically going to be set in the rollover for the following year. Probably if you're just setting Gibbon up, you're not too worried about the rollover because it's a whole year away and you've got to get through a bunch of stuff first, uh, but useful to, to keep in mind. All right, uh, Gibbon does have an admission system with an application form. We can see that is uh, available by default. If I log out to members of the public, there's a student application form and a staff application form. 
this ties in with the whole admissions process that you can run so that you don't need to manually create user accounts. They're generated by the application process. Um, so it's worth knowing about the settings and that process there. If you want to turn that off, you can go into the application forms and say, we don't want to make this publicly available. And then in permissions, you can say, we don't want to make it available internally as well. All right, I don't think we're going to get in the timetable today because that's a whole separate discussion. That might be another training day. Um, hopefully that gives you an insight to some of the main structures and the, the nomenclature, what we call things in Gibbon um, that might be different to what you call things. I'll say one last thing on, on, on nomenclature before I pass over to Sandra to talk about uh, imports. And that is if you ever find that, that certain labels and names in Gibbon don't match up with your labels and names, you can go into system admin and you can go to uh, string replacement. We just reorganized this menu. Uh, I'm still catching up with the new layout. And what you can say here is uh, every time I see this string, please replace it with this string. And you can do that based on whole or partial strings in case sensitivity, and you can prioritize your replacements. But that basically means that anything that appears in a menu or within the, the system strings, so not user entered data, but the actual interface strings um, will be automatically changed from the original to the replacement string. That can be a really useful way to customize Gibbon beyond just choosing a language, which often addresses some of those problems. All right. Um, any questions before we move on to imports? Yeah, um, hi Ross. Yeah, go ahead, Ray. Talk about the, the user permissions, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm not sure what it is, but I think sometimes when I go into those permissions, and maybe I'm, I'm not really sure how it exactly works. So for instance, if, I, if I'm a teacher and I set certain permissions, even if I duplicate it, I think the biggest problem is when I when I want to view as a certain role or edit as a certain role doesn't always work for me. Is there a reason why that might happen? No, I can't think of one offhand. I mean, it may be that there's a, a bug in there somewhere. Certainly, if you want to view what another role sees, you can use the, the strategy I showed earlier with the, the role switcher. Right, uh, so I've done it, and, and that works perfect for me. Yeah. But maybe it's not the best time for this to be on this call. I just wanted to know if there was any issue in terms of that. Um, we don't have any known issues in that area, but if you if you could capture a bug like that on video or with screenshots, you can always pop it in the forum, um, and then, then we'll try and replicate the bug on our side, and if, if we can, then we'll be able to fix that for you. Okay. Yeah. Don't change the uh, uh, settings, the, the audio and stuff. Yeah. Just going to mute you there, Brian. I think you left the room and came back in. So, um, yeah, just so you know, you're muted. Yeah. So, Ray, does that sound okay as a way to proceed? Oh, for now, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And and obviously, uh, as soon as we find out about any bugs, we try and squash them as soon as we can, uh, just to keep the system as as dependable as possible. Okay. All right, other questions before we move on to importing? All right, in which case I'm going to mute myself and rest my voice for a little bit and I'll pass over to Sandra. Awesome, thank you, Ross, for the intro. Um, so getting started with importing. Uh, Ross, if you'd like to stop screen sharing, I will take over. All yours. Um, and because I'm going to be switching screens a lot, I might go for the dangerous option of sharing my entire screen. Um, okay, so once you start to get up and running with Gibbon, you will realize there's a lot of different types of data that you can import into Gibbon. Um, I know when I first started with Gibbon, we were transitioning from a system that was probably in use for about 10 years, and we had to get 10 years worth of data from that old system into the new system. 
And when I first sat down, there wasn't a system for importing it. So as a fledgling developer, the first thing I built for Gibbon and contributed to Gibbon was a system for importing data into Gibbon because setting it all up from scratch is great if your school has a very small number of um, students, but any larger than that, and you will find that you wanna import things from spreadsheets. So within Gibbon, it used to be located in a module called data admin, but it is now built into the core. So it is under system admin, and you can go data import from file. And when you visit this page, you'll see that there are a lot of different types of um, data that you can import. And we've tried to basically cover the main areas of Gibbon. If there are any areas that we're missing, it's a very flexible, extensible system where we can add new imports, as well as you might've noticed at the top, add custom imports. So what we're looking at here is, um, all of the different types of data. And because Given runs on a database in the background, this allows you to take spreadsheet data that exists in some other form, massage it, get it ready, and then import it into Given. You'll notice beside each action, there's an up arrow and a down arrow. Now the down arrow allows you to export an example of what that spreadsheet data looks like so that as you're preparing your spreadsheet data, you can get it into the format that it needs to be in to get into Given. So what I might start with here today is an example of just one of the very first things that you might do is getting users into your system. So I've scrolled down to the bottom. I'm gonna select user data basic, but there is also user data full and a few that are also more customized for parents and staff. And those just include different fields. So when I click on the import option, it's gonna give me some basic imports for how to select the file. In almost every instance, you can leave these as the default because your file is probably coming in as a CSV file or it'll be coming in as one of the supported file types. Um, given supports file types for CSV, XLS, SLFX, uh, XML, and ODS. So if you are using something like OpenOffice, you are also able to import, but also CSV is generally the default. So if, it, if you're not sure if it's supported and you can export to CSV, definitely see if you can get your file into CSV. Before you import, if you're curious what types of fields are available in that import, you can quickly glance here down the list and it'll tell you all the fields that are available. So as you can see, I picked one that's called a basic user import um, and it includes a lot of the basic user information, name, gender, um, what their role in the system will be. I can preview and quickly go into the full import and you will see this mirrors a lot more of the data that um, is available for a user. And there's a lot of fields here. The important one to note is that some of the fields are marked with stars. These are the required fields, but a lot of the other fields are available for you to import at that time. It'll give you a bit of a hint on the right-hand side here of what kind of data is expected for that field and some of the maximum. So if you are importing something that's over the character amount, it'll usually get truncated on import. Um, but if you're also importing something that simply does not fit into that type, it'll generate an error. And we'll take a look at what those errors look like in a bit. Um, since the user full data is a very big import, I'm going to hop back into user data basic and take a look at that import. So um, as we've noted, you'll be able to select a file here. And I have prepared a file today because I'm on the ball. I've prepared a basic import. So what I've done is I've clicked this export columns button. And it's given me an empty spreadsheet, but it's filled in the types of columns that I need. Now, Gibbon is very flexible. You can have different types of spreadsheets with different columns and different column names, which we'll see in a second. This is a good um, place to start if you're starting from scratch or if you just need to get that import set up quickly. So I have created a basic import, which I'm just going to open in Excel here quickly. And this is an example of the, the import that I'm going to be doing. So this is our, our training students um, with the official name, gender. I've given them a primary role, a username, and some other basic information. Because this is Excel, I can hover over the fields, and it'll remind me of which fields are required, as well as which fields, what types of um, characters they require. So we can see under gender, I'm not type, typing the whole word female, I'm just doing M, F, other, or unspecified. So there's some good hints there. You'll find a lot of times when you're importing, it'll ask you for what's called a short name. And that's because Gibbon uses a lot of um, different types of names in the system. And a lot of times to make things nice and brief, we have things that are the name and a short name that pairs with it. 
So as you're hovering over here, it'll tell you what is required. So I've set up a very brief import here, and I'm going to select that file in my file import. When I hit submit, it's not going to immediately import. You'll see that there's a four stage process um, at the top here. I've, I've just moved from stage one to stage two by selecting that file and hitting submit. And it's now going to show us the fields again um, in the same kind of format as before, but it's also going to start pairing them with columns that it has found in the spreadsheet. So these are the names of columns that already exist in the spreadsheet. Luckily, because I'm using a spreadsheet that was downloaded from Gibbon, these names pair up exactly. But if I was using a spreadsheet that I wrote myself or that I'm possibly working with another person, they're combined, you can also select the specific column. So if this one, instead of being called surname, was called last name, you could come in here and select the last name for that student. It's also going to show us an example, and that's basically taking the first line that it found in the spreadsheet and showing it up here um, next to each column so that you can see which pieces of data are being paired. So this is a good way to know if you've selected the right column and if it is likely to fit into that spot. So there's some hover over options and reminders here. We can see a star that gender is required. I can hover over and see what the, those options are expected by the system. Um, because if I, in, in this specific case, if I provided something that didn't match one of these four options, it will generate an error. Um, theoretically, if I've entered everything correctly and I hit submit, it will not generate an error. So the important thing to note when I hit submit is it's going to that third step called the dry run. So it hasn't quite imported yet, but it'll check all the data and let us know if everything is ready to go. In this case, everything is ready to go. It's checked over the file. It's found exactly one row. It's found zero errors with those rows, and it has done a simulated insert to see if those rows are ready. Um, the data is tacked on here just as an example. Sometimes it helps to just be able to glance at it, get a good sense of, are you importing the right data? Is anything missing? Um, so it's just kind of hanging out here. If I were to hit submit, it will then import that. So you, when you're doing an import, you don't want to stop on the dry run phase because the data hasn't actually been imported yet. You always want to hit submit and do that final import. Luckily, um, moving from the dry run to the live run, you should see everything is also green because it has pre-checked anything for errors at that point. Just as an example, because it is checking for errors, I'm going to edit my spreadsheet, give this person a new name, but I'm going to select an option that is not valid and save that again. You can always restart uh, an import from the top by using the breadcrumbs and finding a way back to step one. So I'm now going to try and import something that does not match. So we can see the options available. This does not match. Theoretically, this will generate. Oh, OK, I should have tested that ahead of time. That is not generating an error because it is probably going to force that back to the default value. I will show you an error in a moment. I should have tested that one ahead of time. But it, it's also good to know that in certain values that are very simple and default, like gender, it is going to force that back to a generic value and apparently not you up or continue. So that is a basic user import. Um, we can see there's a lot of different ways to import. So as Ross was mentioning, one of the first things when you're setting up your school that you need to do is to start enrolling your students in the school. Um, so what I might quickly do is pull up and show you. Um, moving the controls for Zoom. Um, pull up and show you that our new student training has just been imported. So this was training McTest that came from our spreadsheet. And we can see that all the data that I selected here was imported. There's a whole bunch of other fields that'll be left blank and default because we only did a basic import. The essential ones here have been imported, including a username for that student. Now, if I were to type training up here, if I were capable of typing training, um, I would still see no results up here because this is not a student in our system yet. Even though I've given them the role of student, they have not been enrolled in a current school year, so they are not visible as a student in that year. So the next step for this student to be a student in the school year is to enroll them. And as Ross showed us, you can go through students manage enrollment to enroll them manually. But if you have a lot of students, you will probably want to import them from files. So my next step is to come in here. I'm looking for a student. 
admission student enrollment and I would like to upload a new enrollment for that student. Um, very similar to before, you're going to select your file and like a cooking show, I have pre-prepared a file for you um, for this student. So we know the username of this student is called training and I'm going to put them in the year group and role group. Role order is not required, but if your students are ordered in a specific um, order within their classes, you can define that here. I'm going to leave it blank. And I'm, as a note, I'm enrolling them in the upcoming school year within my system um, because they are, I don't know, the current school year is already underway and we're gonna pretend that we're admissions for the upcoming school year. So I've set this spreadsheet up. I'm gonna now select it and hit submit. We can see that it's picked up and, and connected those pieces of the um, spreadsheet, prepared them. We can see a quick preview and I'm gonna hit submit. It's warning us that this is a dry run, but everything looks good. There's no errors generated. So now I'm going to submit that and that student has been enrolled in the system. And I can tell, I can go into students and under student profile, I can find my, aha. I'm not in the current school year, so in the upcoming school year, I can definitely find that McTest training has now been enrolled in the upcoming school year. So if you notice, I might've gone a little quickly there. On a lot of different screens in Gibbon, you will see a year browser. Those are usually the screens that are designed for administration of the school. Not many people within the school will be able to switch between years. And as Ross pointed out previously, there are other controls for switching between years based on logging in or using the year switcher. But sometimes you just want to be able to switch quickly and preview and manage data in, in different years without changing your actual current year that you're logged into. So I can just quickly preview the 2021 school year and see apparently there's a few other McTests in my system that have been enrolled, but training McTest is ready to go and is now part of the year seven cohort for that school year. So now that I have imported that, I'm gonna keep making my way back here into import from file. I, have, I won't be able to search for my student in the finder here, because again, I've enrolled it in the upcoming year, not the current year, but that student does now have a profile. And if I didn't wanna find them, um, knowing that they're not enrolled in the current year, I can also use the all students checkbox. So we can see training with test is now a student in the system, they have a profile, but they have not, um, they have not um, been enrolled in the current school year. They are enrolled in the upcoming school year. Um, so as we go back here, since this is a demo of importing, I won't get into too many other areas of the system, but it's important to know that there are a lot of different types of things that you can import into the system. Um, because I've just imported a student, so I've created a user, I've imported a student, I might also want to start thinking about what classes and what courses that student is going to be enrolled in. So uh, within Gibbon, and again, all schools are a little bit different. They might be called subjects. They, they might be called something else. But within Gibbon, we have larger course areas. Those represent the, the things that are being taught generally in individual classes. Um, and those are subdivided, I'm sorry, into classes. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick import example here of what um, you might want to import if you are importing a course. So again, you can export the columns that are required um, and set them up. So I've set that up ahead of time to show you an example of what a course looks like. Those are all matched up. And I've now imported and created a new course for the upcoming year. We can see 21-22 called training. And within that course, I might want to create a class. So I'm also going to import and up create a class within that course. And I realize I'm going a little quickly because I don't want to go too much over time, but we can see that I'm going to quickly create a class for that course. And it is basically a class is a very simple delineation. This is basically class A within the course of training. As a reminder, you'll see a lot of areas in Gibbon are use something called a, a short name, or in this case, name short. And that is just a shorter representation of the name, which especially if you're working with tons of spreadsheet data helps just keep things brief um, and easy to read. So I've entered that data, it's ready to go. If there was an error, it would highlight that error for me and say that the course, the class does not exist. 
And I may just briefly show you an example of an error because you will certainly probably run into one. So I'm going to add an X. So this course now does not exist. Or sorry, that was, that was a class that I changed. Yes, the class does not exist. And it has generated an error. So now it's, it's going to let me know what error the row is on. So in row two in my spreadsheet, um, which lines up with the, the, the row that I just edited here, row two, we can see it's saying there is an error. And it's telling us the error is in the course um, ID, which is uh, field one. And because it's a computer, it's counting from zero forward. So we can see this is column one, zero one. It has found an error and it says each course should match an existing name short and school year in given course. So you'll see there's, there's a little bit of nomenclature of the database structure coming through here, but it's basically saying that there is a mismatch that I'm trying to enter a course that does not currently exist. And that's because that name short, that course does not exist. If I wanted it to exist, I could have previously imported it. Um, the last step that I could do is to also start assigning students into those classes. So there are imports. Uh, student in, uh, enrollment is to enroll a student in a school year. But once you have courses, you will also want to start enrolling your students into the actual courses and classes. Um, I might not go through that full process, but definitely know that that is available to you. And it looks very similar. You'll see their school year, the short names of courses and classes and a username or email. And this is actually a new feature in version 22 is that in areas of the system that previously required you to put a username or an email, you can now choose one or the other. So you're not specifically having to set up your spreadsheet only to use usernames or only to use email addresses, but you can use whatever makes sense for that import. Because um, a lot of times you might have one or the other, emails are easier to read and understand they might not be unique within your system though. So usernames are always unique and you can re rely on those. Um, that is a very quick brief look at things. There are also ways to customize your Im imports and I will very, very quickly, cause I know we're running short on time, just give you a glance that um, there is a way to define your own custom imports in Gibbon. So if a piece of data doesn't exist that you desperately need to import into the system, definitely reach out on the forums and we can um, give you some guidance, but know that there's an extensible system in the background to help you set up um, custom imports for your school. And that's definitely important if you are coming with a lot of different types of data and you have to figure out how to fit those pieces into Gibbon. Um, that is a very quick and brief overview of the importing system. Definitely explore it if you're coming into Gibbon for the first time. Almost all of these will match the various different areas that you will find within Gibbon, um, setting up things like departments, staff, all those various things that you can find in our database. I will pass this back off to Ross. Oh, we're getting some feedback. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Sandra. Um, the next, next session, session is about, is about to start. start. Oh, Sandra, Sandra, I'm just going to mute you. There we go. Yeah. Um, the next session is about to start momentarily, which Sandra will be running on reporting as well. Um, we'll just give her a moment to catch her breath after that session. Um, uh, one thing I found interesting the other day, I was convinced that, that YAML, which is the import format that Sandra was showing you there, YML, I was convinced that it stood for yet another markup language, uh, which I always thought was quite humorous. But when I went to investigate it, they've actually changed the name to YAML is not markup. Uh, so if you're into obscure IT trivia and the difference between what is and isn't markup, there's an interesting project that's changed its identity. Um, hopefully that import section there builds on what you've already seen in the getting started in that I showed you the interface way to, to set things up and how the structures work. And then give, um, Sandra's then given you a preview of how to use import to do that much more quickly. Um, and of course, there's just so much data in schools that when you're setting up or as you're running the school, there are times when imports are far more effective than, than manual imports. All right, um, we'll just take a, a momentary break here before we move into the next uh, session, which as I said, is on reporting, which is a newer area in Gibbon.
um, highly customizable, highly flexible. So I'm just going to pop my camera and mic off for a moment. And Sandra and I will be back in uh, probably three minutes to get that next section going.